The city of Chicago is known for many things. The Cubs, deep dish pizza, gangster culture, and of course, the wind. But perhaps the strangest thing in Chicago is a vintage World War II German submarine, also known as a U-boat. And how it got there, that might surprise you. Germany's U-boats were a significant threat during World War II, particularly in the early years of the conflict. During the Battle of the Atlantic, their primary objective was to disrupt merchant traffic en route to the UK and to force them out of the war. During the early stages of the war, U-boats were sinking naval and merchant ships faster than they could be produced. It was such a problem that British Prime Minister Winston Churchill once said, the only thing that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. Getting supplies to the UK was a key strategy to defeat Germany. And to that end, convoys began to be organized in September of 1939. Germany's counter to those convoys was to establish a blockade of the Atlantic shipping lanes utilizing the U-boats. A particular dangerous portion of the Atlantic crossing was known as the Black Pit. It was located in the mid-Atlantic, an area that did not allow for Allied air cover. It was truly a no man's land. Between September of 1939 and May of 1943, more than 70,000 Allied deaths resulted from U-boat attacks in the North Atlantic, many occurring in an area known as the Black Pit. In 1942, Allied losses had reached their peak with 1,664 ships being sunk. But Allied countermeasures and a change in tactics would force Germany to withdraw from the Atlantic in May of 1943, during a time referred to by Germany as Black May. And during that month, one quarter of Germany's U-boats were lost. In addition to the North Atlantic, Germany deployed U-boats in the Mediterranean Sea and the North Sea. But no matter where they were sent, they were highly effective. They were a key component to the German war effort and were feared by Allied sailors and mariners. U-505, the U-boat that would eventually find itself in Chicago, played an important role in the effort and has a very interesting operational history. A history which includes her captain killing himself while on patrol. U-505's keel was laid down on 12 June 1940 in Hamburg, Germany, and launched on 24 May 1941. She would be commissioned on August 26, with her first patrol occurring on 19 January 1942. Attached to the 4th U-boat flotilla, U-505 would not see any action until her second patrol. It was during that patrol, her first combat patrol after becoming fully operational, that she would get her first kills. Along the west coast of Africa, she was credited with sinking her first ship, and within a month, she would sink three more Allied ships. U-505's third patrol resulted in two American ships being sunk, the Sea Thrush and the Thomas McKeon, along with a ship belonging to a Colombian diplomat. Now that ship was not a warship or a merchant ship. Its sinking gave Colombia the justification to declare war on Germany. Leaving for her fourth patrol on 4 October 1942, U-505 en route to the north coast of South Africa sank the British vessel Ocean Justice. But on 7 November, U-505's luck almost ran out. On patrol near Trinidad, she surfaced and was surprised by an RAF maritime patrol aircraft, which dropped a bomb directly onto her deck. The result was one dead and one wounded and significant damage to the sub. After two weeks, U-505 was made watertight again and limped to a German base in France for more extensive repairs. She would be the most damaged U-boat to ever make it back to a base. After six months of repairs, she set out again seeking her next victim, but had to return to France after being attacked by three British destroyers who elected not to play the victim that day. But on three separate occasions, U-505 had to abort her patrols due to equipment failures caused by French dock workers working for the resistance. U-505's 10th patrol was one her crew would likely never forget. 
After undergoing repairs for 10 months, she set out en route to the Atlantic. Before she could make it, she was spotted east of the Azores by British destroyers and attacked. U-505 and her crew endured a severe depth charge attack. Now, although only sustaining minimal damage, her captain, Peter Zayak, shot himself in the sub's control room. The sub would return to port for repairs and to get a new captain. Now, it should be noted that there is some dispute about what really happened to Captain Zayak. But in his memoir, former U-505 crewman Hans Gobler confirms that Zayak's death was by his own hands. Her 12th patrol would be U-505's last and perhaps the most interesting, and the one that would ultimately result in her being brought to Chicago. The Allies had intercepted and decrypted German messages that indicated that U-boats were operating near Cape Verde, west of Africa. Their exact locations, however, were not known. So, the United States Navy dispatched Test Group 22.3 to the area to hunt and hopefully kill the U-boats. Commanded by Captain Daniel Gallery, the task group was made up of the aircraft carrier Guadalcanal and five destroyer escorts, the Pillsbury, Pope, Flaherty, Chaitlin, and Jenks. The task force sailed from Norfolk, Virginia on 15 May 1944 and began searching for the U-boats using high-frequency direction-finding equipment along with air reconnaissance. And on 4 June 1944, the task force had found its prey. The Chaitlin made sonar contact with U-505 only 800 yards off her starboard bow. As the Guadalcanal moved away to get in position to launch a Grumman F-4F Wildcat to join the TBM Avenger that was already in the air, the other ships in the task force moved towards the target. Depth charges were dropped and Hedgehog anti-submarine mortars were fired. And one of the aircraft fired into the water as the destroyers continued their attack. Soon, a large oil slick appeared and was announced by one of the pilots who enthusiastically stated over the radio, you struck oil, sub is surfacing. Less than seven minutes after the attack began, U-505 was forced to surface. And when she did, the destroyers and the two aircraft opened fire on her. The sub's captain, realizing that all hope was lost, ordered his crew to scuttle her and abandon ship. And while they were successful in getting off the sub, they were unsuccessful at scuttling her. U-505 began to circle in a clockwise direction at about seven knots. And Captain Gallery had a great interest in capturing a U-boat and he had his captains prepare for such an opportunity, like the one that had now just presented itself. The survivors of the sub were picked up, and a boarding party was led by Lieutenant Albert David of the Pillsbury. Inside 505, they found the body of a dead German crewman, but no other casualties or crew were left on board. After securing all the German charts and code books, they closed the scuttling valves and disarmed all the demolition charges. This was the first time that a U.S. Navy vessel had captured an enemy warship since 1815. And along with the sub, an intact Enigma machine was recovered. The Enigma was used to encrypt and decrypt messages during the war, and its capture provided valuable intelligence to the Allies. After the Pillsbury failed to secure a tow of the sub, a tow line was rigged from the Guadalcanal, and the task force with its prize in tow was on her way back to port. After towing her for 1,700 nautical miles, she was transferred to the fleet tug Abnaki and brought into the Great Sound, the location of the Navy's operating base in Bermuda. The 58 former crew members of U-505, now Allied POWs, were taken to Camp Ruston near Ruston, Louisiana, where they were kept in secret until the war's end. They were not allowed to have any contact with any other POWs, and the Red Cross was not allowed to see them for fear that the Germans would find out that U-505 and her Enigma machine had been captured. So now you know the history of U-505 and how she came to be in possession of the United States. But how did it end up in Chicago of all places? For the remainder of the war, the Navy kept U-505 at its base in Bermuda where it was studied by naval intelligence officers and engineers. 
so that Germany would continue to think that she had been sunk, it was painted to look like an American submarine and named the USS Nemo. After the war, she was used to sell E-war bonds and put on display in New York City, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Now, if you purchased a bond, you'd get a chance to board and take a look around the ship. After the bond tour, it was moored in Portsmouth Navy Yard in Maine. Now, the Navy had no further use for her, so it was decided that U-505 would be used as a target for gunnery and torpedo practice until she finally sank. And now an admiral, David Gallery opposed that plan. He contacted his brother, who was a Catholic priest and a Navy chaplain, who in turn contacted Lennox Lohr, the president of the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, to see if they would be interested in the sub. The museum had been looking for a submarine to display for many years, and now one was available. All they had to do was get it to Chicago. So what's the connection to Chicago, you ask? Well, the Gallery family was from Chicago. The United States government agreed to donate U-505, and Chicago residents were able to raise the $250,000 needed for transporting and installing the sub at the museum. And in July of 1954, the Coast Guard towed the U-boat through the Great Lakes and to Chicago after making a brief stop in Detroit. On 25 September, U-505 was dedicated as a permanent exhibit and war memorial, paying tribute to all the sailors who died during the first and second Atlantic campaigns. There was only one issue with 505, however. Everything inside the sub that could be removed had been. So while it might have been nice to look at from the outside, she wasn't much to look at from inside. So Lennox Lohr contacted the German manufacturers who had supplied the submarine's original components and asked if they'd be willing to supply replacements and all agreed to do so at no charge. In 1989, U-505 was designated a National Historic Landmark, further emphasizing its importance in preserving the history of World War II. But that's not the end of the story. You see, the Navy had removed the sub's periscope and placed it in a water tank at the Arctic Submarine Laboratory in California that was being used for research. And in 2003, the lab was torn down and the periscope found. It was donated to the museum to display along with the sub. And in 2004, after decades of being outside and subjected to the harsh Chicago winters, U-505 was beginning to show her age. It was moved to a new climate control location of the museum and restored in June of 2005. And in 2019, she was further refurbished and additional artifacts added to the exhibit. U-505 is the only U-boat of its kind left in the world. If you haven't been to the Chicago Museum of Science and Technology and taken a tour of U-505, I highly recommend that you do so. The preservation of U-505 is crucial to understanding the history of World War II, the Battle of the Atlantic, and the role of U-boats in the conflict. And it serves as a valuable educational resource and a reminder of the sacrifices made by those who fought during the war. There's a place in the Arizona desert where history comes to rest and is preserved for future generations like U-505 has been. It's called the Davis Monthan Air Force Base Boneyard, and it's home to some 3,000 aircraft, some of which have played crucial roles in military operations and technological advancements. To take a deep dive into the history of the largest and most famous aircraft boneyard in the world, click the screen now. And until next time, I'm Dennis Gill for Revealing History. <laughs>